It's a great pleasure to be here. And very much thank you for all the organizers for doing this uh, non-trivial task at this uncertain times. OK. Uh, if you want the slides, they're on my webpage, the notational.co.uk. If you go to the talk, it's the first, the first link. So you can look back. You don't have to copy things. So this week is about probabilistic programming, reasoning about probabilistic programming. And one of the goals we want to do with probabilistic programming is build statistical models. Okay, and what we want to do is build expressive, rich, readable, explainable models. Okay, and for that we need, like any language, we want uh, uh, building blocks that uh, uh, make it easier to build those models. Okay, so if we look at the, the needs uh, uh, of statistical modeling, uh, you know, you definitely want uh, discrete, finite spaces, you know, Boolean true, false, you flip a coin. Uh, uh, you might want some categorical distribution like uh, an enum or, or an algebraic uh, data type, cat, dog, giraffe, um, at kind of the, the very basic, right? You want to work with discrete probabilities. Then maybe you want to start thinking about infinite quantities, right? So natural numbers, uh, uh, rationals, strings. <laughs> and so far, you the foundations are, are pretty uh, 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 well behaved. Uh, and then you, you, you want to add the uh, continuous uh, distributions maybe because you're describing some kind of uh, uh, infinite process or some kind of continuous process, for example, over the reals, something like a weight, <coughs> something like a, a, a hyper distribution, like uh, Annabelle said at the beginning of the week. Uh, um, and then things become a bit more uh, murky, but still okay. Uh, you know, we add the uh, uh, co continuous distributions and, and we kind of know how to deal with them. And so far, we're in the realm of standard world spaces. These are very well behaved spaces. Uh, and then the usual uh, way to generalize this to kind of more general spaces uh, is, is measure theory, go to measurable spaces, and, and then things become a little bit more uh, uh, um, interesting. Okay, so, so uh, um, in the past few years, we've seen uh, quite a few breakthroughs in trying to replace measurable spaces uh, uh, with, with other kind of uh, semantic models, uh, 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 some of them pioneered by people in this room. Uh, uh, so there's the, the impressive probabilistic coherent spaces with measurable cones, and Thomas, Mi Michel, and uh, uh, Christine, I think all of them are here. Uh, uh, there's the Boolean value models, there's the uh, row, band, row Banach spaces, regular ordered Banach spaces. Uh, uh, and this talk is specifically about uh, a piece of work that I was involved with, uh, quasi borel spaces. Uh, uh, but really, this talk is not necessarily about quasi borel spaces. It's more about uh, an invitation of what you can do once you have a measure theory that has high order in it. Okay, and, and, and one of my uh, um, uh, strands for this talk is that even if you're doing just the standard Borel spaces, if you're do doing probability on the standard Borel spaces, you still can benefit from escaping into a universe where you have these high order uh, entities and they can explain uh, uh, concepts and operations on the very well behaved fragment of the standard Borel spaces. Okay, that's very concrete, like uh, the, the the bit patterns of probability, right? You, can, if you look at them and you know what's there. It's, it's, it's all the abstract domains that, that are uh, a bit harder to, to, to uh, cope with. Okay. So, so the core idea for quasi borel spaces, okay? So, so for tr if you kind of put it side by side with uh, uh, measure theory, uh, uh, we, we flip one, one, one uh, 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 you know, one axis. Okay, so in measure theory, you have a space. Okay, uh, I, I drew it as a torus. I don't actually know which spaces are like uh, uh, tori, but uh, it makes pretty pictures, and I think uh, uh, it's nice to look at. Uh, uh, um, and, and what you do with measure theory, you, the primitive concept is a measurable subset that corresponds to a set of events you're interested in measuring, okay, the probability of. Uh, uh, and once you uh, uh, postulate the, the measurable subsets, uh, uh, then you have derived notions like a, a random element, so some kind of random point on the, uh, 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 on, on the space. Uh, given by uh, some kind of a measurable function from uh, uh, your sample space into the space you're currently looking at. What we're doing with quasi borel uh, space theory is we flip it. We take as primitive the, the idea of uh, uh, random elements, okay, ways in which you can map probability onto your space. Okay, so I have some uh, uh, sample space, and if you put some probability on it, the random element pushes that probability onto the space in some way. Okay, and once you... Uh, 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 postulate that and, 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 and uh, 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 define the random elements, and you can derive the measurable subsets. Okay, so you have this, you know, all the concepts, but slightly in different, axiomatized in slightly different order. Okay, and, and what I want to do today is chase the consequences of that and what a higher order measure theory can look like. And it's an invitation for other uh, uh, people in the room to do something similar uh, because I think 
it can be very pretty. And, and, and somehow the probabilistic concepts, they like to live in a higher order world, I think. And that's what I'm trying, I will try to uh, present today and tomorrow, hopefully. Okay. So, so, so this category of, of quasi borel space, this universe of quasi borel spaces, uh, uh, it's like measure theory, it extends, it goes beyond the standard borel spaces and it's a conservative extension. So if you start with a standard borel space, you move out into quasi borel spaces and you come back, uh, 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 you could have proved it without leaving it. Right? It's just that the proof might have been really, really complicated. Okay, so it's a bit like um, a metaphor I like to use is the imaginary numbers. Right? If, if I use an imaginary numbers to solve a real equation, I get real solutions. There's still solutions, it's just that the proof might have been much longer if I didn't use imaginary numbers. Okay. Um, okay. So, it's a relatively young uh, area, even you know, quasi borel spaces, but uh, it's still quite wide. So, so uh, uh, um, we, we uh, uh, proposed this category of quasi borel spaces and we uh, uh, added uh, 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 a domain theory to it with uh, omega quasi borel spaces. Uh, and then it was really exciting to see Foray kind of pick up this idea and try to push it in the direction of universally measurable sets rather than Borel sets as, as kind of the basic structure. And we'll see uh, uh, what that means uh, in a few slides. <coughs> Uh, uh, and uh, other people uh, pushing on uh, uh, differentiable programming uh, with that uh, and kind of mixtures of differentiable and, and probabilistic. Uh, 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 and we've, we've tried to apply it to, to kind of Monte Carlo inference uh, uh, design, Monte Carlo inference algorithm design verification. Uh, and I was, was really exciting to see someone else apply to, to the semantics of network programming uh, uh, as well. Uh, um, and I, I must confess, uh, uh, Early, I thought it was because it's just a kind of a very conservative extension uh, uh, to standard Borel space. I thought, okay, you can do these things with it, but the moment you start doing real probability theory, you might get stuck and, and you won't be able to prove those theorems. And, and I'm quite happy that I didn't get st as stuck as I thought I would. <laughs> um, so so uh, uh, I'm, it's still p part of this talk is, is work in progress, uh, uh, so, so it might be a little bit more uh, um, exciting for me, but maybe a bit, uh, uh, you know, not the final say, you know, might hit the wall in a few weeks. Uh, uh, but but that's, I think that's okay, right? Uh, it's, it's good to, to be excited about what you do. Um, and what's really exciting about this as well, uh, Dario's here, uh, um, uh, who, who, who used uh, this kind of very probabilistic universe to, 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 to give a, a better model for, for, for uh, fresh name generation, right? Uh, so, so instead of generating a fresh name, you just toss an, a, a random number uniformly distributed and somehow that gives you better behavior on high order uh, uh, function spaces, on high order kind of uh, uh, types uh, uh, than you, you would if you did some kind of the kind of a low, uh, uh, name generation monad or, or kind of pre-shift category. It, it's, it's cool, <laughs> properly cool. Uh, and, and it hinges on, on some deep result in descriptive set theory uh, uh, where you kind of analyze the function space uh, uh, and you see that uh, uh, by uh, uh, kind of doing things probabilistically, keeping less state around, uh, uh, you can actually uh, uh, be a bit more fully abstract. It's not fully abstract, I think, but, but uh, it's more fully abstract. And, and that's properly cool. Uh, um, okay. Oh, yes, so this tutorial, as I said, it's a wide area. I'm not going to go into almost any of those uh, pieces of work. Uh, some of these people are here, others are very reactive. Uh, and, and of course, different people will be interested in different things. What I want to do is make this uh, a tutorial, okay? So uh, um, hopefully you'll learn something. Uh, um, and really try to make it uh, uh, pedagogical. So I'll go slowly. I be, might be uh, showing proofs, something you usually would not show uh, during a seminar. Uh, but the really point is to let you have a peek behind the scenes, what happens when you're working with them and, and see what that looks like and see if you like it or not or how that compares with your experience. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I'm hoping that you know, some of you will be inspired to actually pick it up uh, uh, and then you could gain some working knowledge uh, by kind of tracing those footsteps. Uh, I'm not sure you'll be able to immediately see everything, uh, uh, but, but if you pick it up and you know, if you get stuck, let me know and, and, and so on. Uh, and maybe tomorrow we can do uh, some more questions and answers in the beginning of the, of the talk. Okay, so, uh, so the point is, even if I don't get to the end of my talk, it's more important for people to follow. So, so please ask questions interactively uh, online or, or, or in, in the room. Okay? Okay. So the theme, because it's more interesting to have a theme, I'm going to walk towards something, but really, again, it's all about the journey. 
Okay, it's about uh, 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 going through the structure of quasi parallel spaces and, and, and how that uh, lets you do higher order measure theory and what structure is actually there. So, so I had to pick, uh, I wanted to pick something, so I picked uh, uh, Kolmogorov's conditional expectation. Uh, uh, I, that's a result I didn't think I, I was going to get, uh, and I was uh, uh, surprised that I could. Uh, uh, so, so, as I said, this is what I'm excited about. So, so what is conditional expectation? And I'm going to talk about it hopefully more that when I get to it in the second part of the of the uh, uh, tutorial, but kind of just to give a taste, uh, uh, you have two spaces, so kind of the, the real space, this kind of the torus, and then some kind of a, 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 a partial observation space, right? You know, you might not have access to all the samples, you're just doing one sample. Okay, so you have this kind of observation uh, 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 map between them. Uh, um, and you're trying to kind of uh, learn or approximate or understand uh, uh, some kind of quantity, some random variable of the perfect sample of this, of kind of the, the true distribution uh, uh, and, and what comes, uh, you know, into this picture is, is the conditional expectation uh, which kind of averages out uh, uh, or is somehow the best, the best approximation in some sense, the specific sense, uh, to the original, the kind of the true observation uh, uh, along this partial sample, okay? And, and what's interesting about it is that it's, it's really a, a, you know, a high order operator, right? So, so it takes a random variable, okay? So if this is my true sample space, it takes a random, random variable there and uh, it gives you another random variable uh, uh, on the other space. So this is a type two functional, is that correct? Am I, am I counting correctly? Uh, yes? So uh, it really wants to live in that type. Uh, uh, um, and uh, um, what usually happens with measure theory is you can't talk about that space, okay? So, so if you wanna say the conditional expectation is measurable in some cases, you can't, you have to wait until you end up in the first order space, and then you can say it's measurable. Okay, so for example, if you look at the proofs of the existence of the conditional probability, okay, only when you get down to conditional probability, you can say on some, under some conditions it's measurable. Okay, but you can't say it to begin with because you, you're working with a, a, a type two functional. And then I know this might not be uh, necessarily making sense right now, but we'll get, we'll get that later, okay, just to give you a taste. And, and why conditional expectation? Uh, uh, people say, well, let's just, let's just confess, it looked like a cool th theorem to prove, and when I was looking at other th uh, re results to try to prove, they always kind of uh, uh, reduced to conditional expectations, so, so, so uh, uh, that's why I picked this. Uh, uh, but, but, I mean, it, it does lead to other results, so, so, so hopefully, you know, in the next few weeks, or the next few months, or the next few years, uh, we'll be able to, to trace those proofs. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, existence of radonic derivatives, in fact, we do have radonic derivatives for quasi royal spaces, that's in a note by Matthias Wacker and Lu Kong, on the archive, but uh, what I hope to, to get is uh, uh, the radonic derivative as a, as a morphism, as, 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 a, as, a, as a function in the language, as a measurable function. And I think that's, that's not quite there yet, unless someone has done something really new recently, uh, uh, or the existence of this integration. And we kind of know that you can do that because uh, uh, Foray did it for uh, his uh, quasi-measurable spaces, uh, uh, or universe, quasi-universal spaces. So, so there's, there's hope that we could prove this integration theorem, but maybe we could prove it using conditional expectation, which probability theorists tend to write is the, the right way to prove it. Uh, uh, so I'm hoping to get there. And, and finally, uh, for quite a few years now, I've been trying to understand um, the theory of martingales uh, and stochastic differential equations, and you, know, you can't even start without uh, conditional expectation. It's, it's in the definition of a martingale. So, so uh, uh, if you saw Prakash's talk on, on uh, uh, Markov processes, uh, 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 it would be cool to be able to even think about that theory. Currently, no, we can't. Okay, um, so that's the conditional expectation, trying to hype it up, but maybe we'll never get to it because uh, I'll be so slow, if we don't have so much fun with all the other stuff. Uh, but I'm here, so even if we don't get to it tomorrow, you know, come and talk to me. So, the agenda, okay? Uh, 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 this today we're doing a little under an hour and a half, so let's do it in th three topics. First, I'm gonna talk about uh, 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 Borel sets. So, I'm not assuming you know measure theory, so if you don't know measure theory, uh, uh, it's a very quick introduction. I'm not expecting you to really absorb everything, but uh, if you've never seen it, uh, uh, maybe uh, this could be a way of you, uh, uh, you know, upgrading a little bit where you stand, right? So, the goal is that everyone will upgrade uh, uh, whatever it is that they stand, right? So, if you never heard about measure theory, maybe you, you'll, uh, move a little bit F further. If you have, uh, maybe you learn about quasi world spaces. If you have learned about quasi world spaces, maybe you learn more about uh, uh, how to do things like conditional expectation with them. Okay, so, so that's my goal. And, and so that means that uh, uh, you can stop me, ask questions, and so on. And the slogan for today, if, if you want to take anything from this talk, is uh, uh, um, 
with high order measure theory, you can prove measurability just by type. You just look at something and it's obviously measurable. That's the point. You see a lambda term and therefore it's measurable. And I'll see a few examples. And you can already see it for measure theory, so I'll give some examples. Okay, but uh, for measure theory, you have to be really careful because uh, it's not very high order. With quasi world space, it really starts to shine because you, uh, uh, you can just throw lambda terms everywhere and, and it's, it's really liberating. Okay, so hopefully we'll see some examples and that's kind of the, really the point I want to stress. Okay, you know, there's uh, different objects have types or, or spaces they want to live in and once you put them in, in those, in those uh, 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 spaces, uh, they, they're just measurable just by being there, by, just by virtue of being there. It's, 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 I think it's pretty. Okay, um, so we'll talk about quasi world spaces. There's quite a lot of construction that's going to be the bulk of today, and then we're going to uh, uh, get to uh, measure or, or really probability and integration. So, so that might be a little bit uh, um, more rote if you know how to do these things, uh, uh, but you might see uh, a trick or two that you haven't seen before uh, because of the high order. I'm not overpromising, but, but I don't want to overpromise. But uh, uh, maybe, maybe if you see something that you like, please tell me afterwards. If you see something you didn't like, also tell me afterwards. Or maybe raise your hand and let's have an argument. Okay? A any questions, comments? Someone can't hear me or, or can hear me too much? Someone at home? Can people at home hear me? We can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> so really down to basics, what's kind of the premise of, 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 kind of modern probability theory? You have a space, okay, the space is somehow a, 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 you know, ground truth. You usually don't have access to, to the space where it is ground truth. It has all possible states. So for example, if we, if we think about uh, five uh, uh, coin tosses, right, then we have all possible uh, 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 sequences of heads or tail. Okay, and then uh, we have some experiment or something we want to measure, some kind of outcome. Uh, that's going to be a subset of that state. That's the subset of current interest. And in probability or measure theory, we're interested in measuring it. Okay, so we want to assign some number, weight, length, probability in this talk. Okay, and this, as I said in the beginning, it's fine for discrete spaces, more or less. Okay, it's just kind of doing sums and the, and the vision. And, and when you, once you move to uh, 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 the continuous, uh, there's a caveat, and that's if, uh, if ever you take a course in measure theory, uh, 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 that's one of the first things they, they show you, and of course I'm, I'm showing it as well. Uh, uh, you can't measure all subsets of the reals uh, uh, according to length, right? So, so specifically, if you want to have a function that takes a subset of the reals and give you a, its length, okay? So it, it gives you the length of, of intervals, uh, each translation invariant, so if you move the set around the reals by some constant uh, uh, addition, uh, the length doesn't change, and it's uh, sigma additive, okay, so which means that uh, uh, it kind of you can p take it apart and put it back together and measure it. Right? So if I measure a composite thing, I can measure each part and add, add the results together. Okay, the sigma additivity. You can argue uh, uh, with that axiom, but then you can say, okay, maybe I want to add just two components or finite number of components and have it be continuous, and that's the same thing. Okay, so, so it's just kind of a way of packaging it all up together. Okay, uh, so you can't measure all the sets, and then you have to do something. Uh, about it if you want to measure real, real subsets, so you restrict to a subset uh, uh, of the subsets, okay, so you know, already high order. So, so uh, the Borel subsets, uh, we're going to say what sets we don't want to measure. So, so at the very least, we want to measure the Borel subsets. So what are these? We have the open intervals, as we said. Okay, and then we start closing on the, uh, uh, the sigma algebra operations. The three of them, the empty set complements with respect to your total space and uh, countable unions. Okay, and Again, I just want to talk about the reals, but I've already just given you what the sigma algebra is, so I might as well uh, 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 say what the measurable space is. Okay, it's just a, a space that has a collection of subsets that you want to measure. Okay, and they're closed under these three operations. I think most people in this room have seen it, this, and if you haven't, that's great. Now you have. Okay, so you already uh, uh, moved it forward in the in the rat race. Okay, uh, uh, um, and wh what's uh, maybe a bit provocative way to summarize this? Uh, 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 for the reals, we have to do something like this. Maybe we can go beyond Borel, maybe analytic, maybe universal, maybe Lebesgue. Okay, but you can't take all the subsets. So you take some collection of subsets. Okay, and then you structure the rest of your universe after the worst case scenario. Okay, so every space is now going to be uh, 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 after the worst case scenario. You have the measurable subsets, and, and you have to close under these operations. Okay, so that's provocative. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to, to, to say that, that this actually does come and bite you later, and, and we'll see an example. Uh, any? Questions?
Okay? So let's look at some examples. So I always, always mentioned discrete spaces. So as we said, there's no problem there. So we have a, 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 a set of points, and you look at all possible subsets. And if x is countable, then everything is okay. If x is uncountable, then you start hitting some problems. Okay? Uh, the other spaces we said we want are the Euclidean spaces, so uh, multiples of R. Uh, and then what you do is instead of taking the intervals, you take the chests. Okay, the open chest, and you close on the, all the operations. And you can take subspaces uh, uh, which have this uh, uh, kind of funky definition. The measurable sets are the measurable sets in the bigger space that somehow was you're seeing through the smaller subspace. Okay, somehow through the lens. It's a very natural topological notion, the, the way to define this. Okay, so I think, again, most people, this is known. Okay, and uh, I, w I will need the measurable functions between the reals, but it costs the same amount of, 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 of overhead to just define it for measurable spaces. Uh, 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 a function between two measurable spaces is measurable uh, uh, if the inverse image of a measurable subset is a measurable subset. Okay, it's a kind of a good geometric condition. Uh, uh, Okay, <coughs> and you know, examples, the, the functions that you're familiar with, addition, multiplication on the real numbers, uh, 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 um, is measurable. Basically, any continuous function uh, uh, from Rn to Rm is going to be measurable, uh, uh, and any function from a discrete space is going to be measurable. Okay, so there's actually quite a few of them. And, and that's not all of them. There are you know, functions that are not measurable that might be of interest, and if you have one of those, I, I am super curious to know wh what it is and what you're using it for. So please also come and talk to me because uh, limitations is always good to look at. Okay. Is this? There you go. Okay, so we have spaces, we have functions, so that means we have a category. Okay, so, so I'm not gonna be doing, doing a lot of category theory, it's just a kind of a convenient way of organizing all the data. Okay, so, so, so if, if you, you're not very categorically versed, it could be an opportunity to structure something you know, you know, spaces, events, probabilities, uh, uh, in this language you might, kn might not know. Okay, then we can do it together. So, so uh, the category of, of measurable spaces, it has uh, uh, quite reasonable uh, 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 categorical structure. You have products, you have coproducts, so you can put spaces together side by side. Uh, you can take cell spaces, as I said, and you can calculate limits and columns. But, and this is something that what few people here in, in the room know is, is that you can't, uh, 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 it doesn't have any function spaces. Okay, so the precise theorem is if you look at all the measurable functions from the reals to the reals, so this, and you're trying to equip it with a sigma algebra structure, uh, then the evaluation function, which takes a function and an argument and evaluates the function of the argument, uh, um, is not measurable. So, I have a quick a two slide proof. I can go through it or I can skip it. Uh, maybe show of hands, who wants me to go through that proof? Okay, okay, who, who would like me to, to, to skip it? Uh, okay, okay, any questions before I do it? It's, it's gonna be a sketch, but, but uh, uh, hopefully. Has anyone here seen that proof? Oh, you have a question. Uh, he, in fact, yes, that's, that's what Almond did as, as well. He, he showed that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that, when I, it's a great question, yes. Uh, there is something you can do, it's not going to be a function space, but it's going to be some of the functions. Because uh, if you look at some of the other papers uh, of Almond from that time, he is interested in, in function spaces, he's interested in game theory and, and modeling, uh, all kinds of processes and agents. Uh, um, and uh, I suspect he's interested in, in function spaces. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll come back to that, and if I haven't in three slides, then raise your hand again, please. Okay, any other question? Yes? Can you explain this symbol as a Borel algebra? Can you stop? Here? What, the, the, uh, in the uh, it's, just, it's just a tag to kind of help you remember this is the sigma algebra on the, f on the, f the candidate sigma algebra on the, on the function <laughs> space. Okay, so it's like, a, a cool co I could have called it X uh, or, or U or something, but, but uh, uh, this is a mnemonic. Right, it's a, it's a, the world sets on the function space. Okay, great. Good, I like this. Uh, uh, any more questions? Yep? Yeah, I, where are uh, measurable functions defined so that the inverse image is uh, again a measurable set? Why is it not forward? Because um, when you want to push a, well, 
Okay, maybe does someone have, I'm going to give an answer. I don't think it's going to be a great answer. Does someone here think they have a great answer? <laughs> yeah, thanks. The question was, wh why do we define a, 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 a measurable sets to go the, in the other direction? Okay, so I have a kind of a lowbrow answer, but if someone has a high level answer beyond the fact that it's a, 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 a kind of a geometric condition. Yeah, Toma, do you have a? No, okay. <laughs> Okay. So, so what you technically do is you, you, you start with a measure on your source and you want to push it, you know, map it on, on a space. Okay. Uh, so the way you do it is uh, uh, you take a, a measurable subset at the target space and then you look at its inverse image to see how to, how to measure it, what, what mapped onto it. And that's why you need that condition. Okay. You need that set to be measurable. But, but I don't think it's a great answer. Okay. So, so if someone else has a great answer, uh, I see there are, there are things in the chat. So. We can, yes, show the proof. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure this is a very satisfying answer, Benjamin, but, but uh, uh, um, if you ever find one, I would also be interested. Okay. okay. There's another one? It is just like the definition of, exactly, yeah, it's a geometric condition, but, but uh, you know, why is it like this for continuity? It, it does the job, but I don't really have a, a good, uh, you know, it works, I can see how it works, but why it works, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I mean, you want measurable subsets to be functions into two, and functions go back. <laughs> Again, I kind of I can see how it works, but I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I'm with Benjamin on this one. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to just you now quickly give the proof. Uh, uh, um, so it relies on two ingredients. So the first one is the Borel hierarchy. Okay, and if you've done some complexity theory, you might have seen it, or, 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 uh, um, or, or some uh, 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 model theory, uh, you may have seen it. So, so what we do is we're starting here with the sigma zero zero set. These are all the open sets, right? Or kind of the sets we're starting to close over with our sigma algebra operations. Okay, uh, and then we, we add uh, 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 we, we, we add complements. Okay, and then we take both. Okay, that's the first level. And then we we take uh, uh, countable unions from here. That gives us the sigma one. Or, and we can take uh, uh, complements, that's going us to pi one, and then we take both, okay? And so we continue going, okay? And, and, and it's not obvious, but at every step you add something new, okay? And even when you get to omega, to the first kind of uh, 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 limit ordinal, right? You still keep adding stuff and you have to continue, okay? And it's only at omega one that you stop adding stuff for the reals, okay? It stabilizes it kind of the, the first uncountable ordinal. You have to go a very, very long time to get there. Okay, at every point you're adding a new set. Okay, uh, and, and at that point you're getting all the Borel sets. That's why you, you the, the sigma algebra operations stop adding stuff. Okay, and now what what Alman did is say, well, for every measurable set, there's a point. I mean, this is what ordinals are for. There's a point at which it appears first. Okay, that's its rank. Okay, so that's the first gadget. Uh, uh, we we adding complements and unions and complements and unions and complements and unions and every time we get adding more and more sets and we keep track of when was the first time we hit a set. Okay. And now comes the proof. Okay. So so I'm not sure proving to you you know why you keep adding sets, but let's take it as, as a given. It's kind of a basic result in descriptive set theory. Uh, okay. So if we had a measurable function eval, okay, the way that the product of measurable spaces work is you take the, all, all the boxes and you close under the uh, sigma algebra op operations. So if I took more measurable functions, I would just make it more measurable rather than less measurable. So let's just assume it's kind of the full thing, but uh, so we can, we can measure ev every subset, okay? That's not gonna change the measurability of eval, okay? So if it was measurable, well, let's look at, uh, uh, so it goes into the reals. And look, look at the inverse image of all the rational intervals. These also generate a sigma algebra on the rails. Okay? So we only look at countable collection of subsets. That's a countable collection of ranks. If I look at the rank of every inverse image. So it's a countable collection of countable ordinals. It has a, 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 a supremum. And that supremum is smaller than the uncountable ordinal. Okay, let's call it alpha. Okay, and now because of what I said earlier, there is a measurable subset, a Borel subset, that has a higher rank. Let's call that A. And now look at the indi indicator function. So in the talk, I'm going to call this the indicator function. For every x, I check whether x is in the set A. 
And if it is in the set A, I return one. If it's not in set A, I return zero. That's a measurable function. Okay, so I can uh, uh, evaluate with respect to that function. Okay, so I can evaluate an argument for that function, and I can take the uh, inverse image of one according to eval, according to this pair. That's going to give me a measurable subset. Okay, of the reals, and that subset is going to be A actually. Okay, so that size is rank A, but it's the inverse image of one, which is a you know. A close. Uh, 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 oh, I kind of set myself to fail. I should have taken closed, uh, uh, closed, uh, 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 closed interval. Sorry about that. Okay, but if you take the closed interval, then then uh, um, you know that's one of the numbers I took the, the suprema of. Okay, so it's smaller than alpha. Okay, so I got the contradiction by chaining everything together. Very pretty. <laughs> okay, now back to your question. We have these ranks. So what I want to show is if you, if you say I'm not taking all the measurable functions, just the one that are measured up to alpha, is works. There is a sigma algebra. Great. Yes. Uh, oh, here. Be because when you tuple, it, that's a continuous function. Uh, so the continuous function, its inverse image, as we say in the chat, maps a, 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 a Borel set, kind of a Borel set to a Borel set. So the rank, if you had something at level alpha. Uh, before you map that, you're going to have it at level alpha or before. Uh, I mean the middle line. Yeah, yeah, this one. I mean this one, yes? No, no, no. In the middle. Uh, this one? Yeah, further up. Further up. This one? No, this up. one? Uh, okay, so uh, um, uh, each one of these is a measurable subset in the product, so it has to appear at some stage. That stage is going to be a, a, a accountable ordinal. And I have countably many of them, uh, so it's going to be a countable ordinal. Sorry for glossing over that. Thanks. <laughs> Do more of that. That's great. Uh, questions in the chat? Okay. It looks like they're having fun, but I'll get distracted. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll chase up on later. If you're my attention, say, oh, I'd add in capital, capital letters. Okay, any other questions on this? Okay, so all the hard work was this rank uh, uh, hierarchy, but, but after that, and, and kind of what's happening here is, is, is the fact that this product is, is kind of throwing in all the sigma algebra operations, right? And you have no, no control on what's happening. We'll come back to it later. Okay, so, so Alman closed the lids on the high order structures uh, uh, of, of measurable spaces in the category of measurable spaces, but I don't want to be unfair, it does have higher structure, okay? And in fact, if you look at Alman's paper, he, he takes great pains in saying when, you know, you might have some higher structure as well. So an easy case is to say, if you're exponentiating by a countable set, right? You're taking a discrete uh, space, uh, 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 so countable discrete space, and then it's just a product. That looks <laughs> you know, simple, but actually it does have a lot of juice in it. So, so let's look at some examples where you do have this higher structure in measure, okay? You don't have to go anywhere else. Okay, and, and when you look at uh, textbooks, they, they use that, so, so uh, 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 sorry for uh, belaboring it for, for others. I just don't, you don't oversell positive world spaces. You already have some higher order structure, and that can maybe give you a hint of what would come. So let's look at one Borel set, uh, uh, the Cauchy sequences. Okay, so we're looking at uh, 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 the standard Borel space in, uh, of sequences in uh, the extended real line. Uh, and we can say, pick all the Cauchy sequences, all the con convergence, or the sequences that converge to a real number. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, if you think in calculus it's going to be uh, uh, for all exists for, you know, for all exists for all, uh, you can do it with, uh, by, by uh, uh, ranging over the rationals. Okay, so, so what is a Cauchy sequence? Uh, uh, for every epsilon, uh, there exists a point in the sequence such that after that point, uh, 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 um, things are, are closer to each other. Okay, up to epsilon. And, and this is what this says. Okay. So, so y you can definitely do that, and that's uh, now a Borel space that you have, that you can play with. And you can define a, 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 a measurable functions out of it. The, the limit, taking the limit of a sequence, goes out of the Cauchy sequences into the reals. And if, uh, doing your proof, you're using this limit, then you don't have to check measurability, it's just measurable. You don't have to do, take an inverse image gain that you have to do, in, 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 you know, if you do it manually. Okay? So you can, you can build up a, a, a kind of a little to toolkit of, of uh, uh, measurable operations you can use to to show more and more things are measurable, but, but at, at some point it, it bottoms out. And that's the point of this talk. Uh, 
Questions? Yes? Um, so when you say conver uh, converging, you mean to infinity? Oh, what, what? Cauchy sequences do converge to a finite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. uh, but but uh, I might say also converge, uh, converging sequence that goes to infinity as well. So it depends on how you set things up. Uh, and okay, but but I know that's not necessarily the, the right thing. When I was an undergrad, we said diverging to infinity, or <laughs> something like that. And apparently in other places, we say tend to infinity. So yeah, you have to kind of be very explicit about what it is that you're saying. So that's great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, and here's some more examples. Okay, so we, we can compose this. Here's an example of composing these, these building blocks. So we can talk about vanishing sequences. Okay, so these are all the sequences that uh, 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 converge and go to zero. Okay, and now we can use that to build the approximating function that takes uh, 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 the rate of convergence, a vanishing sequence. Okay, and a real number and gives you back a sequence of rationals that converges to that real number. Okay, and if I'm, if I'm building uh, uh, something by picking rationals that converge to a real number using this function, that step of the proof is measurable. Okay, and that's, that's a slogan I'm trying to build here. If you have enough building blocks, you can just get measurability by type checking. You just look at it and you say, uh, 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 this is the lambda term, it's fine. I don't have to worry about it. Okay. And you can do that for approximation if you have enough building blocks, right? You can take the minimum number such that something, something rather works. Uh, I have a, I did it on a, on a, in a sheet. I invite you to do it as an exercise, but you might want to set things up a bit uh, before you, 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 you write that down. Okay, but really kind of building things like minimum or maximum or arg argmin or argmax, what, what we use to program, right? Only we allow to take uh, um, infinite unions and uh, countable unions, but infinite unions and infinite intersections. Okay, and, and this is the point, that not, not all operations of interest uh, uh, fit this. Okay, so for example, uh, if I have a, a sequence of functions, okay, I want to take the, the limb sup of that sequence, which is uh, 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 for every, every point I'm taking the limb sup of that sequence, I can write as a lambda term. Okay, it's blocking a bit. Okay, but I just say take the limb sup of the sequence. That looks perfectly innocent, but of course it doesn't, it's not obviously measurable. But it should be. Okay, but it's, it's not because you have this function space here. So it's only when I then apply it at a, a layer point that I will be able to give the proof that it's measurable. Okay, so this, this is where the higher order measure theory starts to peak. <laughs> okay, you know, and we'll see more of that. Okay, it's an intrinsically higher order operation <coughs> that we want to use. Any questions? This is the first example of higher order measure theory. And, and, and you see this, right? So when you look at the uh, uh, martin Gale convergence theorem, it says you have to choose a version, choose uh, the limb soup. Okay? And that's going to be measurable. Okay. So that's what I said. Okay? Uh, if we leave the first order, uh, then it's, we can only finish the measurability proof when we come back to, first, to the first order. Okay? Yeah. Any questions? People are. There's quite a lot of discussion. I don't think it's directed at me. Okay. So, as I said in the beginning, there's a, there's a collection of spaces that are nice. Okay, there's the standard Borel space, and let's just define them now so we can keep track of them as we go along. Okay, so what's a standard Borel space? There are many equivalent definitions. This is the one that most easily fits on a slide. Okay, that's not necessarily the, the one that you, you would come across in textbooks. Uh, 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 measurable space is standard Borel when it's measurably isomorphic to. So there's a measurable function going one way, measurable function going the other way, and they compose with anything on both sides. Uh, so it's measurably isomorphic to a Borel set of the reals. Okay, and that's the good part of, of the, the category of measurable spaces. Or rather, that's where it works really well. Uh, um, if, you, if what you care about is beyond that, then it works a little bit less, less well. Uh, 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 but it doesn't mean that you don't need it. <laughs> if you need it, you need it, right? Uh, uh, but then I'll be very I'm, I'm interested to know what it is that you're trying to do. Because it's always good to know, you know, maybe I should be moving to a different universe. Okay. Questions on this? OK, 
Okay, so style array space, as I said in the beginning, style array space includes the discrete spaces, discrete countable spaces, and the countable products. They also include the reals. Right? The reals is a Borel subset of the reals. Uh, and so you can take uh, products of them, countable products of them, and so on. You can take subspaces, Borel subspaces, okay, by definition. You can, you can do that proof. Uh, 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 and countable coproducts, putting them side by side. Okay, because the Borel subsets are. Uh, uh, just subsets from each, and you have only countable many, so it's a countable union. Okay, so, so notation, you have the unit interval, you have the positive reals, you have the non-negative uh, extended reals, there should be a line over that. Uh, 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 the weights, okay, which is the uh, extended non-negative reals. Yeah, that should be, a, that's a typo, there should be a, a round bracket. Uh, uh, and the extended reals, yeah. Okay, these are all spares of interest in this talk, so we'll come back to them. But uh, uh, I'll try to remind you of those notations. Okay, so back to our agenda. We talked about a, a little bit of kind of classical measure theory. Uh, I really just needed the Borel sets, but it was as easy to, to uh, give you the measurable subs, uh, spaces because that's what they do, right? They just take the, the worst case scenario, they take the Borel sets and make everything uh, uh, fit that mold. Okay, so it was just easy to say that. So now let's go to quasi Borel spaces. Okay, and uh, uh, again, the, the point is to keep you along. So, so, you know, if I don't get to the end of the talk, I'm happy if you picked something up, so pick something new. Uh, okay. So what's a quasi borel space? After this long uh, 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 introduction to uh, measurable spaces, uh, uh, like a measurable space, it has two components. You have a, a set of points, the carrier set, just like a measurable space. But then as we said, we, we, we change the primitive notion. We have a collection of functions that we can use to map probability or measure onto a space. So it's a collection of functions from the reals onto the carrier, which we call random elements. Okay, because you know, the picture you have in mind is, is this picture, right? I have my, my sample space in the background, there's some distribution on it, and it helps me pick a random point on the space. Okay. And it has three closure axioms, so uh, 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 constants, precomposition, and recombination. Okay, and I'm going to go through each one of them uh, in time. So the constant one says, if I put all the mass on one point, if I look at a deterministic element, that's also a random element. Okay, putting all the mass on one point is fine. That's a random element. Always can do it. The second one, precomposition. So I have a random element, and then I do some kind of a Borel measurable rearrangement of the, of the sample space. Okay, so I'm kind of mapping it into these columns. Then doing the composition gives me also a random element. Okay, so concretely, if I have a random element and a measure, Borel measurable function, Okay, so this is a Borel measurable function. The composition of first doing the measurable function and then the random element is also a random element. Questions so far? See head scratching. Is it? I don't understand why, why these alphas. Why are these alphas going from, like this way, from reals to the space rather than the other way around? Uh, um, why should it go the other way around? It's not a, I'm not, I, I just, yeah. w w what's, what's leading you to think that? Yeah, ma maybe I don't understand the interpretation of like these two spaces, like the, I yep. guess there's like the reals and then there's the torus or whatever, yep. or like, yeah, so how should I think of these two spaces? So this is the, the sample place, the sample space where, you know, you, all, all the, you have all possible uh, uh, outcomes. Okay, and then uh, uh, there's various kind of uh, observations you might make in your space uh, uh, and two different uh, 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 state in your sample space might lead to the same observation or outcome in your space. Okay, so, so if, if, if I push forward the probability onto my space, I will get a probability on my space. This makes sense? No? Can I make a remark? Yes, of course. So I think the way to think about this, I mean, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that since you want to be inventors of this, but I think the way to think about this is that the R is the source of randomness. And, and the other space is where you're observing the effect of the whatever random process is happening. Thank you, Prakash. You're a lifesaver. Okay. Th that clearer? I mean, when, when you look at probability textbooks, they... they, they do that. They, they, they say uh, a random element uh, uh, goes on the function for the uh, sample space, and they have these results on how you can move from one sample space to another by adding more, more probability. 
uh, to the sample space without changing the, the law. Right? It's not called a transfer law, a transfer, um, transfer law uh, uh, or, or, or similar names. Okay. Oh, I love that. So, so maybe like, yeah, I think I think that's better. But still, not sure why couldn't I associate like a single point in this source of randomness in the reals to multiple points in the observation, like like a kernel. Yeah, like a kernel. But uh, um, kernels on the reals. So we have this result that you can always randomize kernels on the on the reals. Or with these probability kernels or s finite kernels. So, so if, if you have a, a kernel on the reals, there exists a measurable function from uh, 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 the reals time the reals, and if you push Lebeg on one of them, you get that kernel. So you can always add another source of randomness at the source rather than as a stochastic transition. I, I'll actually um, I might get to that, that later, okay? but it's, it's called the, the randomization theorem. Okay. 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 And we're actually going to take it as a principle later when we define uh, uh, probability. Yeah, I, I guess if it was presented that way, I think it would be easier for me to kind of understand the meaning, but I, I can see, yeah. That's good. Great question. I love this. We're kind of going deep into it. Yep, at the back, Rafael. All the way to the back. Uh, could you just recall what is the morphism in SBS? I mean, the, the phi here, from R to R, yes, what are the... I, I mean measurable, I could have said measurable, is that... Okay, it's just measurable in R. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's a, a Borel measurable function of okay, from the bridge. Yeah, exactly. Great. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. And the final axiom... It's what I call nowadays called recombination. So the picture only has two, but you think a countable one. So, so let's, but let's look at start with the picture maybe. Uh, so I have two random elements, and I say uh, uh, this bit of the sample space uses uh, uh, this one, and this bit uses the other one. And I map it in different ways. Okay, but kind of the general form is I have a countable collection of random elements, and then I partition the reals into a countable collection of well sets, disjoint. Okay, and then I can do the kind of the case split, right? If I'm an, use alpha n, and so on, and that's also uh, uh, going to be a random element. That's the third closure condition. I love it. Usually people just swallow the second axiom and, and argue over the third, and here it's everyone knows probability. That it, it's, 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 it's refreshing. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, yes? Can this be expressed as a kind of a shift condition? Yeah, exactly. This is where they're all coming from. Yeah, so, so, so uh, 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 we took uh, 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 the way we, we got this. I mean, it's not presented this way, but you take the standard world spaces, you look at pre shields, you add a, 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 a two topologies, actually, one for doing a shift, one for doing a, a separatedness, and that's how you get these three conditions, if you can include the handles. And in fact, that's how we got some of, of the other spaces, by doing exactly that. So when we wanted to get um, uh, domain theory, we, we changed set to omega CPO and cranked that handle, and we got omega QBS. Okay, what, what you get is a quasi-topos? Exactly, a quasi topos, yeah. Fantastic. Yes? Sorry, uh, why is this going to be bothered? Okay. Yes. Um, wh why is this joint important when you partition R? Uh, then you, you're going to have to choose, you know, one of them, right, if they overlap. So you can s either say that they agree, but because it's measurable space, actually, then, yeah, you don't need that because you can always chop the measurable subsets to, to all the... Uh, Non-overlapping bits. Okay, so so yeah, exactly. In, in a shift condition, then you would have to agree you on you the overlap. You don't need the compatibility exactly. condition because you, you are in in, uh, in, in board sets. So exactly. You, you can yeah. take the complements. Exactly. Complements differences. Precisely that. I love this. More. more? Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so these are the three axioms. Deterministic elements are random elements. Precomposition with a measurable function uh, over random element gives you a random element. And recombination of countable collection of random elements is a random element. Okay. Three axioms. Let's look at some examples. Okay. So the paradigmatic example is the reals with the Borel measurable functions from the reals into it. And uh, it's closed under these three operations, right? A, a constant function is measurable. A, a precomposition with a measurable function is a measurable function. 
uh, uh, and uh, kind of a countable rearrangement of the probability, uh, uh, sorry, countable recombination is also going to give you a, a measurable function. It's a bit more to check, but, but it, it fans out. And in fact, we didn't really have to take the reals. You could take any measurable space, and, and we'll come back to that construction later. Okay. Uh, uh, two other uh, uh, constructions. If I have a set, there's two ways I can turn it into a quasi royal space. I can take the, the least amount of random elements or all the random elements. Okay, so if I take the least, it's, it's, uh, what I get is all the sigma simple functions. So this is uh, all the basically recombinations of constant functions, because that's what I have to have. Uh, and that's the discrete quasi royal space on X. And if I do the opposite, I throw in all the functions, uh, then that's uh, also a quasi royal space, and we call it the indiscrete quasi royal space. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. So what's a m measurable function? What's a quasi world space morphism? Okay. So like with measurable space, it's, it's a function from the carrier to the carrier, a point to a point. Okay. But measurement, maybe you like that. <laughs> it goes forward. So, uh, uh, so if, you have, if I have a random element on X, okay, so it goes from the reals to x, uh, uh, then I post-compose with a function, with a morphism, I get a function from the reals to y, and I ask for that to be a random element. Okay? So it's an algebraic condition, rather than a geometric one. Um, okay, so for example, constant functions are always going to be a, a quasi borel space morphisms, because when you post-compose a random element with a constant function, you get a constant function, and that's always a random element. Okay. And the same way, you, you can recombine them and you get the, the sigma, sigma simple functions are always uh, 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 um, uh, morphisms, always measurable in this sense. Okay, and the identity morphism is always, the identity function is always a morphism, and the composition of uh, morphisms is also, uh, the functional composition uh, of morphism is also a morphism, so we get a category which we call QBS, quasi plural spaces. Okay, and as I said, I'm just going to use categories to organize things. I think this, the next slide is going to be the, one of the most categorical ones. Okay, so uh, for the people in the room who appreciate adjunctions, we have, we organize this into a few, a few adjunctions. If you don't appreciate adjunctions, maybe you appreciate this. Uh, uh, they tell me exactly what the limits should look like, the limits of the columns, all of them, in quasi rural spaces. Okay, and I'm going to uh, 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 kind of detail that in the next slide with products. Okay, so it's a bit abstract for this one, but if you... Just wait a little bit, uh, we're going to look at something very concrete. Okay, so uh, in the previous slide we had, uh, given a measurable space, uh, I can construct a quasi borel space. In fact, that has a left adjoint. So what, what happens in this adjunction, we can think of it as saying, every measurable space has a quasi borel space carrying it. It's there in the background, whether you want it or not. Okay, so we have a left adjoint from QBS to mesh. So you can add freely the measurable space structure, and you have a right adjoint going backwards, it carries it. Okay? To set, you have both. Okay? The, uh, the left adjoint is the discrete one, the right adjoint is the indiscrete one. Okay? But what this means is that uh, uh, if I take limits and co-limits in QBS, it's exactly like in set. So products in quasi world space are, have the product of the carriers. Co-product is the co-product of the carriers. I have to find out what the random elements are, but I actually there's always a way to do that. Okay, and we'll do that in the, in the next slide. Okay, so kind of the slogan to take from this part of the slide, every measurable space is carried by quasi borel space. It's there. And we'll see that later, actually, when we look, look back at Alban's theorem. Any questions? It's going to become concrete in the next slide. If, if, so if it feels too abstract, just hold on a little bit. So let's look at example. Product. Okay, so I have two quasi world spaces, X and Y. Because of these adjunctions, it means that there can only be one structure. It's going to be the, the, the product of the carriers with the projections and the, the kind of the tupling morphism you need for pro products, for putting them together, it's going to be the tupling from sets. What's missing is the quasi world space structure. Okay, and that's what we need to detail, and once you do, it checks out. Okay, and what is the structure? A random element on the product Okay, so it's going to be a function from the reals into the product, and that's by the universal property of products is two functions, one for each component, the first projection and the second projection, and each of them needs to be random elements. So these are exactly all the random elements, the correlated random elements. I have two of them and they, they move together. If I observe them separately, I might not know that they're correlated, but if I observe them together, I'll see the correlation. 
Okay? And you can do the same thing for uh, uh, co-products and uh, quotients and so on. Okay? They're there. Okay. Any questions? Is, is this, this help to kind of make it more concrete or do you still feel... I see all the category theorists nodding, so that's not a good sign, right? I kind of want the non-category theorists to nod. Okay, so someone asked me this week, why do you need adjunctions? Here's one reason, right? It tells you what the limit should be, okay? Just by calculating a little bit of a, you know, a, a free objects or co-free objects. It's ma like magic. This is like category theory at its best. Okay? Yes, so let's look at back at Almond's theorem. Oh, wait, did I, did I skip something? Ah, yeah, I did skip something, sorry. There was a little bit of a gap. Uh, function spaces, so this is you know, what I promised to, 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 to pursue, right, is that we have uh, uh, the quasi world space of measurable functions between two objects, and it's surprisingly not surprising, right, surprisingly straightforward. Okay, so what is the carrier of the function space is all the quasi world space morphisms from the source to the target. And all of the random elements, well, they can only be one thing. <laughs> Because of carrying, we have this, this kind of carrying bijection given by the definition of a function space. Okay, these are going to be uh, 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 what? All the functions from the reals into the space. But if you uncarry them, you get a quasi world space morphism. That's what it has to be. Okay? And evaluation is the usual evaluation. You take the function and the element and you apply it. And that's pretty nice. Okay? And it's a quasi world space morphism. This being simple is good because that means we can do complicated things with it. Right? If it was complicated, then it would be difficult to do complicated things with it, but sometimes you have to. Okay? So let's go back to Arman's theorem. Okay? So just, just kind of to try to reconcile what, what's happening. Okay? So we have, at the low level, we have eval, okay? going from reals to the reals, times reals to the reals. We can apply the, the left adjoint to go back into measurable spaces, and this is what we get. Uh, uh, um, um, we get a morphism going from reals to the reals times reals, made into a measurable space, into the reals. And by some result we'll see later, this ends up just being the measurable space of the reals. So, so we do have that morphism uh, uh, in measurable spaces, the evaluation morphism. It's just not going from the product. It doesn't factor through the product, because the products in the measurable spaces are different. The, the, the left adjoint does not respect the products. Okay, and that's what Armand Stevem said, that you can't factorize this. Okay? So if, if things seem like incongruent because you have a measurable map in quasi world space and not in, in measurable spaces, this is why. It's, it's there, but it has the wrong type because of the product. The product is, is this kind of closing of a, 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 a uh, closing over the sigma algebra operations. Okay. Questions? Okay. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to show a few more constructions that you may not have, have seen before, or you may, you may have. And, and what's, what I find interesting about them is that they let us internalize a, 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 a space or, or kind of a collection of things that we find interesting at the meta level and treat it as a space. Okay? And then that means we can define morphisms and, and later probabilities onto those spaces, which means we can, if you, if you say doing semantics, right, at some point you have to, to take all your constructions and kind of internalize them because it has to happen for all programs, right? Uh, uh, so it's really useful to be able to say, this thing I had in the meta level, I can actually talk about it inside, uh, in the object level. Okay, so let's, this is a bit abstract, let's see concretely what that means. Let's start with the random elements. Okay, so I have this, for every space X, I have the space, of, I have the set of random elements, I can actually turn that into a space. Okay, and what it ends up being, it's just the, expo the exponential by the reals. Okay, and I did a little proof here of why a, 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 a random element is exactly the same thing as an element in the function space and the other way around. If you show of hands, you want me to go through this proof or do you feel like it's an exercise that you can compare with the answers with later? Oh, I need to choose. Who wants to me to go through the proof? 
Okay. Oh, oh, you do. Who, do. who doesn't want me to? Come on, I know you're the chair, but. Okay. Is that okay? You want to as well? Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry, you, kind of, you know these things, but, but, but yeah, that's good. Okay, so let's go through this proof. Okay, pedestrian, I promise this is a tutorial, right? Um, so, two way inclusion. Okay, if you want, you can do a fancy one with other morphisms, but let's just do it with two way inclusions, just kind of lowbrow. So, left to right, I have a random element. I have a, uh, sorry, I have a function. So I have a morphism from the real into x. Okay, the identity function over the reals is a measurable function. Therefore, it's a random element in the random elements of the reals. Right? The random elements of the reals contain all measurable functions, in particular the identity function. Therefore, because alpha was a morphism, precomposition of a morphism with a random element gives you a random element. So alpha is a random element. Yeah, it felt like I wasn't doing anything kind of sophisticated, and then suddenly it happened. That's Yoneda. <laughs> right? That's exactly the Yoneda uh, 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 magic. Okay? You, you feel like there's nothing to see, and suddenly you, you're there. Okay? The other way around, if I take a random element, okay, then I want to show it's a morphism, just lowbrow, right? I have, to take a uh, I have to take a random element over the reals, that's a measurable function from the reals to the reals, and show that the precomposition of the random element with a measurable function is a random element. Well, that's an axiom, right? So that also holds. So again, I, it feels like I cheated again, right? <laughs> is that okay? Okay, but, but uh, I think, as I said, one of, the, one of the goals for me was to let you peek behind the curtain, and the point is that there's nothing there, right? <laughs> it's, 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 it's really nice. <laughs> okay? Any, more, any questions on this? Yes? Um, you, you take all the random elements, you call this indiscrete, and you only take the sigma finite things, it, you call this discrete. So, two, there's two answers. Um, so, one is because one is the left adjoint to the forgetful functor, the other one mm -hmm. is, is, isn't. Uh, the other one is uh, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, well, it basically ends up being the same. Uh, uh, um, all functions out of it, right, of, of the discrete space are, 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 are uh, 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 measurable. Uh, and if you, all functions uh, uh, out of in the e-discrete one end up being the, the recombinations of constant functions. You, it's, it's I made an exercise sheet, but I didn't get to typeset it, so, so that was an exercise to prove that. Okay. <laughs> it's a funny okay. little exercise okay, great, <laughs> uh, okay, uh, to, to show yeah. that, that you know, okay. once you've hit the indiscrete space, you basically can only get uh, 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 constant recombinations. It's, it's kind of neat. Oh, but, but, but because was it okay? Maybe I'm confused. Because didn't you say that when you have all random elements, you yes. call this discrete? It's indiscrete. Uh, indiscrete. Indiscrete. In indiscrete. All random elements. Yeah, in you can always go into it, but yeah. out of it, you, you have to be uh, uh, recombinations of constants. Oh, okay. So, oh, okay. Okay. So, okay. so it's kind of feel like you can cheat by saying I'll just go into the indiscrete space, but actually you kind of basically given up any kind of measurability. You can only have the things that are in any space. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So two answers, I don't know which one was, which one do you like better? I don't know. We have the second one. The second one, okay. Yeah. That's good, collecting, that's the stamp collection. Any more questions? I love this. <laughs> yes, I need to type them, uh, Prakash, uh, uh, but maybe uh, over the weekend I'll, I'll do that. But uh, I'm very happy that you are also, yeah. You have the advantage of you can corner me in Edinburgh, because uh, you're currently there, and, and say, give me the exercises. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Okay. So that was one example, right? We took, we took uh, uh, an entity in the meta level, random elements, and we turned them into a, a, a space. Okay, that's really useful. Let's look at subspaces, okay? That's also useful. We'll see a lot of that uh, uh, tomorrow. 
So if I have a quasi growth space and a subset of it, I can, like with measurable spaces, take the, sp the subspace generated by that subset. So what is that? That is all the random elements that factor through the subset inclusion. Okay, that's again a natural definition. Okay, and, and I will write this kind of a, a curly arrow, means I only need to give the subset because the rest is determined by it. Okay? N now comes the, the internalization step. So remember we had this left adjoint that took a quasi world space and equipped it with a sigma algebra. Okay, by taking all the sets A that are their pre-image under every random element is a Borel measurable set. So they have, you know, they're going to become measurable if, if we take all the random elements to be measurable. You do some little <laughs> slide of hand, okay, and you get that these are all the, this is the same thing as all the functions into one plus one, the discrete uh, uh, space. You, it's a little calculation, you might not, if you see it, it's amazing. If you don't, then it, it's, an it's an exercise, okay? But now, uh, 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 we have a notion of internalizing function spaces, so we can say uh, uh, the sigma algebra of a space is all the functions into one plus one. Okay, now I have the Borel sets as a space. And shout out to Dario and his collaborators, right, where, where they, they, use, they use this fact, so if you're looking at the Borel space of the Borel space of the reals, that's called the Borel, the Borel on Borel subsets, well, unless I'm mis misreading your paper, right? Uh, um, and th they use the, the intricate structure there to, to, to kind of cut stuff out of the function space to get a tighter full abstraction result. Is that, is that a good summary? Dario, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, you, you, you get it credited on what are measurable operations on measurable sets. The, the entire thing Dario and Benjamin suggested. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, so you, you can do this. You can repeat this if you want. I, I've not gone higher up than that. Okay, but... but it's there if you want to, and they have used it. So it's, it's usable by some people. Okay, any questions? Okay. So now we can talk about standard world spaces. So remember, we had standard world spaces for measurable sets, measurable spaces. Now I want to have standard world spaces for quasi royal spaces. Okay, and then of course I'm going to show that they agree. So if I have a quasi world space S, it is standard Borel when it is quasi world space isomorphic to a Borel set of the reals. It's the same definition, but this time the isomorphism is in quasi world spaces. And the point is that it doesn't matter at this level. Uh, th those two categories, the way I set things up, are isomorphic. Okay, so again the slogan quasi world space as a conservative extension of standard world spaces. Okay? And I had a little example actually, and I think that that's perfect. So let's do an example. This, is, this ties to something that Prakash uh, said yes, uh, yesterday, two days ago, when we talked about processes. It's not the same C0. So Prakash has a C0, that's not the same space. This is just uh, all the continuous functions on the reals. Okay, so we're looking at continuous functions on the reals. A well-known result is that it's a, that's a Borel space. And the way you usually prove it, correct me if I'm wrong, is you define some uh, metric and you show that it's separable and complete, uh, uh, and then you show that evaluation is measurable with respect to that uh, 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 metric. Okay? I'm, not, I'm gonna <laughs> cheat, <laughs> almost, right? And not do any of that. Okay, but I will do some, the, the crucial part of that proof. Okay, so let's, let's, let's prove it. Let's prove that uh, uh, C0, all the continuous functions, the reals, are standard Borel. So let's define another uh, 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 space, C0 ta uh, prime, okay? And it's gonna be a Borel set of R to the Q. So it's a countable product of the reals. That's a, sta that's a standard Borel space. Uh, uh, um, and so it's gonna be a isomorphic to a, subs a Borel subset of the reals. So if I can show that C0 is isomorphic to C0 prime, I'll be done. Okay, so what is this C0, C0 prime? Um, I have this thought cloud that I learned from, from Chad. Uh, uh, the idea here, right, the main idea. Uh, so I learned it from Chad and he learned it from Robin. Is that correct? <laughs> okay. Uh, not, not, not the content of the bubble, just the bubble itself. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, 
The idea here is, is this uh, uniform continuity theorem. If I have a, a continuous function on a closed interval, then it's uniformly continuous. Okay? And that's the trick. Uh, um, so what, are the, what is C0 prime? It's going to be the data I need in order to establish the uniform continuity. Okay, so these are all the, so I'm restricting to only the value of the, of the continuous function on the rationals. Okay, that's dense in the reals. Okay, and now I have to say what it means to be continuous at that level. And I, and I say for every, uh, uh, every interval, every A and B, okay, every epsilon uh, positive rational, there exists a delta that is the radius of uniform continuity. Okay, so I have to say that for every P and Q in the interval, if the distance is less than delta, then the distance of the image of the sequence is less than epsilon. Okay, this is just phrasing the uh, calc 1, 101 uh, uh, uniform continuity, but only using countably many uh, predicates. And I've, that's, that's what you do I mean, with measure, usual measure theory. Okay? But the trick here, and I did it without uh, uh, pointing it out, I'm taking this as a subset of the reals. So automatically I have evaluation as a measurable map. I already have a QBS structure here. All I have to do is, that, is to show that uh, uh, the isomorphism is compatible with it. Okay, and then you can just show it. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, why are they isomorphic? Well, if I start at C0, restrict to all the rationals, this is going to hold because you have a continuous function, so it's uniformly continuous on every interval, therefore this holds. Other way around, I start in C0 prime, I then need to uh, uh, find the value of the function on every real point. But remember, I have this approximation morphism, which is completely measurable. It's not high order at all, right? I have it in measurable spaces. Okay, that says, if you give me a real number, take the limit of the value of the G on the approximating sequence of rationals. I just look at it, it's measurable. I don't have to check anything. This is the slogan, right? Measurable, measurable by type. And that's it. Okay, this is obviously a Boyle subset because there was just countable conditions everywhere. I did the other, I have to check that, you know, going the round trip is identity, but that's okay. And that's why it's a standard Boyle space. It's measurable by type because I just take the subspace, Alex. So Alex asks, is there a step where you have to show that C0 itself is measurable by type? What I don't know is that it's a standard Boyle space. This is what this proof is doing. Did I answer your question? You need to show that checking continuity is a predicate in QBS. That's what this is doing. It's checking continuity using uniform continuity. And what's built into it is that if you were continuous to begin with, right, then uniform continuity holds. I don't have to uh, check continuity. It's enough to check uniform continuity. So it's important that I'm, I'm only considering the continuous functions. If I took more functions, I have to do something else. And it's not clear I will be able to. And in fact, I won't, right? Because if I take all... Yeah, okay. Do you need to show that checking continuity is a predicate in QBS? Okay, I'll answer that. Is that okay, Alex? Anything else? Great. Okay, so, so again, this is well known. It's not, it's not a, I didn't prove anything new here, but I think it's pretty. Uh, um, just by, you just take the crux of the proof, which is this encoding, okay, and everything else is by type checking. Yes, you have the lambda terms. Huh? Any questions? Okay. Yeah, so I didn't have to, to construct a complete separable metric. I didn't have to show that evaluation is measurable with respect to it. Okay, this is the things I did not need to do. Okay, so we are now more than halfway through the QBS section. So I think I will continue, unless there's other questions, which is fine. So as I said, I don't need to get to the end of the talk. It's more important that I get to the depth of your understanding. Okay, so a few more things. It, it, it does look like a little, uh, uh, we're kind of doing a tour de force, but I will want to use it later. So, so, so I'm gonna show you a few more things that you may have not seen uh, that I will need later. 
So a boil embedding, I'm going to use this curly arrow, so what's that? That's an injective function between the carriers whose image is a boil set and is strong. So uh, uh, the random elements in the source are exactly the random elements that factor through the, inclusion, the, the injection. Okay, so uh, um, it's a bit more than a strong monomorphism if, you, if you're thinking that way. Okay, it has this uh, uh, boil image condition. Okay. <coughs> in fact, one of the exercises I have in my sheet is, is kind of looking at all this class of, all, a lot of classes of, of monomorphism and finding the examples within them. Philip knows because he's seen it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so let's look at some easy examples. Let's start with easy, easy example. Uh, uh, the terminal object of quasi world space is the single point quasi world space, which has a single point and a single random element that puts all the mass on that point. Uh, is a is Borel embeddable, has a Borel embedding into two, actually, uh, um, two of them. Okay. Um, and here is one of the points. Uh, space is standard Borel if and only if it's Borel embeds into the reals. And, and there's nothing happening here, it's just a reshuffling of the definitions. Okay, but it's a way of thinking about it in a slightly different way. Okay. Non examples, Dario again. Okay. So if I'm looking at the uh, uh, subspaces of the world sets, for example, all the, the collection of subsets of world sets that are not empty, that's not boil embedded. That's not a world set in there. And that's you know, in your paper. And you can use that to kind of show that a lot of set, set theoretic operations involve comparing sets are not measurable. They're not, they're not world sets. And they've used that uh, 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 technique uh, uh, to, to kick stuff out of the model and, and, and get it to be tighter. Okay, so you can't, you, can't you can't check topology, that's not a measurable operation. You can't check equality or, or containment or non-triviality. Uh, um, none of those things is, operation, is, is measurable. So if you're going to check it, you better have find a different way of checking that, uh, the, these conditions. Like we did with continuity. Okay, we replace continuity, which is hard, with uniform continuity, which was easy. So a partial map from X to Y, if you like domain theory. I'm not going to do a domain theory, I'm just going to do a little bit of domain theory, just to get partiality into the picture. Uh, um, that's a, a total function from X to Y, together with kind of an, a, a new bottom element. But there's no order, it's just kind of a, an error element. Okay, like in set, if you do maybe on set, there may be more not on set. Okay, and its domain of definition is the inverse image of everything that doesn't hit bottom. Okay, it's also, if you're used to it, it's standard. If you're not, this is what it is. There's nothing else to it. Okay, and then you can show that that ends up being a Borel embedding uh, 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 of the domain in X. Okay, and you have a, a, a partial order, and that's the usual partial order, which is F and G between partial maps between two spaces are uh, less than the, each other if they're point-wise, if one is defined and the other is defined and they're equal. Okay, and if you like restriction categories, and I know people in the room like that, uh, that's a model. And if you're a bit more old-fashioned and you like axiomatic domain theory, it's also a model with the Borel embeddings as your domain of the definition. Okay, this is how you get them. Okay, so now I could use partial maps as my monomorphism. So I can say, look, I don't always get a result, but it's defined on a, on a Borel set. Okay, so I can always check if I'm in a domain or not. That's what this gives me. Am I defined if I am do something? If not, do something else. I can kind of raise an exception. And that's the last concept. Refinement. So, so if I have a predicate, and a predicate here is just a morphism into uh, the indiscrete space or so anything, right? Just, just can check anything, even non-measurable things. Okay, and it's uh, uh, x parameterized. So for every x, I have a subset, and that subset doesn't have to be measurable. Okay, then I can carve out subspaces of the function space and the product space in this way. So one of them looks like a pi type, the other one looks like a sigma type, but they're not pi type and they're not sigma types. The restriction, the restricting to the other functions or pairs that satisfy the predicate. And I would love to have a, 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 a a dependent type theory, and I can have a dependent type theory, but I want it to be, I want, I want these pies, you see these pies, at the bottom, 
they're measurably pies, right? So the function is measurable in the argument. Okay, so the, the model I can build for Martin Law's type theory in quasi world spaces, which it has, because it's a growth of the quasi topos, uh, um, I still need to choose a universe of codes that let me encode this uh, uh, measurability condition into my pie types. So I need to choose the right codes. Okay, so my, my plan of attack is do a whole bunch of measure theory, see all, what operations I need, and then go back and do it again, but with the codes. If someone knows a, a shortcut, then I'll be keen, keen, keen to know, because I would love to have those dependent types earlier, but uh, uh, I'm gonna have to do with higher order logic instead. Okay, so, so we're just cutting down. So in particular, um, I can only do form a pi type if all the components are sub subspaces of the same space. I can't put together spaces, uh, 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 subspaces of different spaces and keep some kind of measurability condition. I can, I can just put them side by side by coproducts, but, but that's, that's not measurable, right? Okay, and just to keep track of it, if the predicate was actually measurable, so it factors through the one by one rather than the, the, in the, the discrete space, I'm gonna use this bold face pi rather than the, the, the single pi. Okay, so it helps me keep track of, of whether it's measurable or not. Okay, but th those spaces are not, you know, they're not measurable, they're not sub royal subspaces. They're still just, uh, uh, just subspaces. So let's look at an example. Uh, if I want to talk about the converging functions, so I have sequences of converging functions, converging everywhere, okay? Uh, I can flip the, the, the n and the, and the exponent, so the n goes inside, and then I can define uh, the converging sequences as the pi of all the uh, uh, f's such that the limit exists. Okay, the limit exists everywhere. Okay, I can talk about that space, and that's a properly high order space. Okay, so that's just a go, we're gonna, find, we're gonna see much better uh, examples later. Okay, and, and this is the point. I said they're not dependent types, they're refinement types. I have to already live in a big space in order to, to form this type. Okay, I can't just put different types from different places together and, and kind of retain their cohesion. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop here, okay? Uh, 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 so we've covered the, the basic uh, 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 concepts, right? So we did some little bit of measure theory, and then we looked at quasi world space and the construction. Uh, uh, we looked at partiality, which will come handy uh, later, tomorrow, and uh, refinement types. And tomorrow, I hope, we're gonna talk about measures and integration, so probability, right? And then I'm gonna start walking towards uh, conditional expectation, and that involves a big tour of spaces of random variables, which is something that you can't do unless you have high order floating amount. And I'll stop here, is that okay? Thank you very much for this very nice solution. <laughs> Are there some questions in the room? Hi, thank you for this great exposition. Um, I was wondering if you could give some more intuition and refinement, um, like maybe just go through the main idea again and like give some why, why it's called like that maybe you're sure let's just I, I, I was a little bit fast to a lot of questions but Tavi asked the question I got another two minutes uh, so, so that's good I've got a top up um, so let's look at the definition a bit more uh, slowly okay well you okay yeah. so so I have a predicate for every x I have a subset and now I'm using that to carve out subsets of either the function space or the product function space or the product Okay, so which subset am I, am I carving out? It's all the functions, such that for every argument x, the image lies in the set satisfying the predicate at x. Okay, but I have to have a function in the original space to begin with. I can't put together uh, 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 functions from different places. I could do it in a, in, a, in a disjoint union kind of way, in a kind of non-cohesive non way, non-measurable way just this joint, just free. But, but you'll see later, we, 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 do want, we, we do want this x to somehow vary measurably. Uh, 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 and I'm not quite sure exactly how to, that will fan out. I can, can do something, but I, I, I'd rather get to the end and see that I, everything I need to do and then ch and verify that, that, that the codes I'm adding uh, uh, satisfy that. Yes? Um, is p just a subset of x plus y? Yes, yes, yes. Just any subset, exactly. 
Yeah, and, and, and here, uh, Q is a measurable subset. Okay, and, and similarly for the dependent, the dependent pair, right, the refined product, uh, the, the second component needs to satisfy the predicate at the first component. Okay, so it feels like people say refinement types are poor man's dependent types, but uh, um, until, until I find a good universe of codes, I'm, I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to use. Like a high, it feels like a higher order logic uh, uh, kind of style rather than Martin Love's type theory, but, but uh, uh, I can fake it till I make it. I can, I can make it. Thanks. Th no. That helpful? Fantastic. Other questions in the room? Is the, the chat, oh, the the chat. Is the stone type duality theorem for quasi borel spaces? So I don't know any. Sean, you said you were thinking about locales. So do you, do you have an easy answer? OK. So there's an opportunity to prove it, Ralph. And if you have any questions, happy to kind of you know help you out, right? So, so yeah, fantastic. Okay. No other questions. Yep. So measurable functions are quite often used to represent time evolution. Mm -hmm. um, of a, um, yep, yep. And the forwards definition where you take measurable sets to measurable sets allows you to have more information in terms of a more detailed sigma algebra in your future events than you do in your current event, mm -hmm. which you obviously don't want for any sort of physical process. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I, That's I, why I you define it backwards instead of forwards. Because it forces the sigma algebra to be at most as detailed as the previous one. Yes, yes, yes. No, I, I, when you talk about martingales or continuous time martingales, exactly where, where this thing comes up. Uh, I'm thinking whether that's explaining the how or the why, but I'm not sure. So that's like a great conversation to have, like over lunch or for tea or, or, or maybe offline or, or, yeah. But that's great, I like this, thanks. I'm, I'm now on borrowed time. Okay, if you don't know the questions then. Perhaps it's time for a break. Thank you very much, Rod. Thank you. <laughs>